Welcome back to Get Global Young Professionals Talk Global Health Podcast. My name is Megan Davis, and I am joined by my co-host today, Aiden Desjardins. This is the Get Global Young Professionals Talk Global Health Podcast, envisioned and created by the Irish Global Health Network and their student outreach team. I am your host, Megan Davis, communications and events intern at the Irish Global Health Network and second year medical student at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. In this series, join me and my student outreach team co-host Aidan Desjardins, a microbiology student at Trinity College, as we talk to inspiring young professionals leading the charge in their respective fields, often operating in sidelines to their career, following their passions above all. Today, we are excited to welcome Rosie Gervais. Here is a segment from our conversation. From the design phase of an intervention, or any programming that you do, you need to be involving the community, having their voices, having them seated at the table, basically. Rosie holds a master's degree in global health from Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland, and a bachelor's degree in international development from the University of Waterloo, Canada. She is passionate about conducting research in global health which was enhanced through her experience evaluating the capacity built amongst Malawi's community rehabilitation officers working in mental health. Rosie currently works with the Aga Khan Foundation as a global data and insights officer and contributes to improving the organization's ability to work as an evidence-driven international development organization and improve programming for the communities it serves across Central Asia, the Middle East, and Eastern and Southern Africa. Welcome to the podcast, Rosie. Thanks for having me. We'd like to start these episodes by asking our guests about how they became involved in global health. Would you mind sharing your story about how you started studying and working in the international development sector and how you transitioned into the field of global health? Yeah, sure. Um, so basically, I think just to start it off, really, ever since I was little, I really had this passion for philanthropy. And that really stemmed from the fact that I'm half South Sudanese. And so considering in South Sudan, we're currently facing com- political unrest and um, so many different challenges such as poverty and so many different development issues, it really paved my way and my interest into studying international development. So that's why I decided to go to Waterloo and complete my bachelor's in international development. And so from that experience, um, as a part of that program, I went on to do a work placement in Ghana, in Accra, and worked in an organization called Child Rights International uh, as a monitoring evaluation officer there. And from that experience onwards, I then really enjoyed working in the developing world and then went on to working in Kenya with the Aga Khan University and conducting research that focused on women's health in the small and artisanal uh, mining sector and from that experience researching in health it really gained my interest in global health generally and so that's when I decided to um, improve my knowledge in global health and pursue a master's in global health at Trinity College Dublin so that's really what really enticed me to move into that into that path in global health and currently now working with Aga Khan Foundation. I'm more on a, an overall role in terms of uh, working with data and uh, data analysis in all different areas, uh, including health and nutrition, but also in agriculture and so forth. But um, I'm glad I'm still able to work in that capacity um, in the area of health. And yeah, so that's really where I am today. And that's my overall journey. Awesome. Uh, you mentioned a number of field placements there. I was wondering, how do you think your field placements influenced your move towards global health? Yeah, so in terms of the placements, just, yeah, just the experience of being on the ground, living in Accra, I lived there for two years, working in two different, well, for the World University Service of Canada, that organization here, um, and with Children's Rights International, just being able to see what takes place in the field, being involved in the trainings when it comes to improving uh, women's involvement in the mining sector and when it focuses on youth training, for instance. 
as well. So just being able to see that, not just from a, from a screen in Canada, just being there in the field, it really enticed me to, to want to stay on in this field in the many years to come. And yeah, and so that's where I'm actually I'm planning on moving to Kenya in March or so for uh, to work with the Aga Khan Foundation because I really enjoy working in the field and seeing the action happen there. So yeah, that really those experiences really helped me to moving there today. Thank you for sharing your experience and your future plans. It sounds really exciting. <laughs> um, after making the transition to global health, what is one piece of advice that you would offer? Um, to someone looking to get into the field of global health and pursue a career? Yeah, so the advice I would give, I would say, is really about improving their their knowledge and expertise in global health. That's what I really wanted to do. So that's the reason I decided to go into doing a master's to improve my my knowledge in that area and learn so much and build the connections within Trinity College Dublin and just meeting people who are working in that area. And so, yeah, definitely in terms of the advice, it would be even if it's going on to pursue further education, even doing courses online, getting certification um, related to global health and um, just adding that to your resume. And then I always emphasize LinkedIn, it's such a great platform for that. And to like, for instance, I'm following all the health related organizations on there and seeing what's up to date, what's the programming they're currently doing. So just making sure you're keeping up to speed um, in that area and yeah, building your network uh, definitely are the pieces of advice I would give. Thanks so much. We'll definitely have to connect on LinkedIn. Uh, yes, definitely. We understand that while working in Malawi, you conducted research on mental health with CBM Global and Malawi's Council for the Handicapped. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so for it was a part of uh, my master's, so I did my research in evaluating uh, the capacity of community rehabilitation officers who are working in Malawi. And so I actually conducted the research remotely. I was supposed to go to Malawi, but because of COVID, unfortunately, that was on pause. But I worked with yeah, CBM Global, an organization working with people uh, with disabilities in the developing world and with the Malawi Council for the Handicapped. So through that research, basically, we were working on evaluating uh, the Mental Health Gap Action Program training. So MHGAP is what it's called, um, that the WHO created. And the purpose of the, the training is to improve um, non-specialized um, healthcare providers to be able to identify, uh, manage, and refer people with uh, mental, neurological, and substance use disorders. So that training was conducted in Malawi in five districts. And so my research focused on evaluating how effective was that MHGAP training to improve about 57 community rehabilitation officers. And so what my team and I found out was that the training, in fact, helped to improve their confidence and uh, delivering community mental health care and it also helped to improve their self-efficacy so their belief in themselves to be able to deliver care to their to their clients and um, so that's what came out from the test results that we assessed but then we also interviewed the program managers and facilitators as well who stated that the training enabled them to address preconceptions they had about mental health and mental illness and it helped for them to be motivated and proactive to go into the communities, regardless of the, of the poor transportation situations that they were more dedicated to help people with mental health issues. And so that's what really came about in the research, but also uh, a gap that was there that was identified was the sustainability of this program, because a lot of the facilitators stated, well, there's a lack of even like the transportation is, uh, is hard to get around, uh, the lack of medication that they'll need, and um, also even things like stationary. So that was something from the research we found. It's, you have to really do have an understanding of what are the resources that are available in the context before even doing an intervention. So you want it to have a long-term impact. So yeah, that really summarizes the the research that we conducted and hoping to publish that shortly. 
From your experience, how do you think global health professionals could better incorporate or improve community-based support for people with mental health in their work? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say that, yeah, it's really about involving the community and really getting a lay of the land. Previously, what I'm talking about with my research, understanding what are the resources that are available and speaking with the community themselves. They know what they need and really being able to listen to them uh, before you do any, any interventions. I really think that can help to improve the support that you give uh, by listening and yeah, taking this participatory ap approach to when you're doing any sort of intervention. So yeah, that's the advice I would give. Uh, as you've mentioned, you've worked with a number of international G NGOs in Ghana and Kenya, as well as Malawi. Uh, what would you say is the biggest lesson learned from integrating the community voice to help better inform intervention development? Um, yeah, the biggest lesson I would say is, yeah, I think it honestly probably <laughs> goes back to the previous question. What I've really learned is that you really can't do anything when, when you're not involving the community and you're not putting that at the forefront. Like, for instance, with my work today, it's all it's always about thinking from the design phase of an intervention or any programming that you do, you need to be involving the community, having their voices at having them seated at the table, basically, from the design phase up into giving back the, the data that you've collected, that you've analyzed, and having them be able to be involved. And so that would be the biggest lesson, because I've seen whilst working in various organizations that it's more of like a diving in and thinking you know what the community needs and starting an intervention, and then it fails because it's not addressing this gap or this challenge um, because no one has taken the time to really ask and involve the people, the stakeholders and the beneficiaries. So yeah, that was definitely the biggest lesson. And did you experience any barriers to this community-based approach or is there any best way of involving the community? Yeah, I'd say like, even from my experience in Ghana, um, I think the language barrier, well, for me coming in, that was one of the barriers, but then it also made me question I shouldn't really be the one asking the questions it should be the people within the country so my local colleagues and I can take more of a, a back seat and um, them asking the questions if we're running a community survey and I can go about analyzing that data so language barriers was one but there's also when it comes to I think a bit more sensitive issues and I would say areas such as gender inequality that it differs definitely based on everyone's cultures. So uh, trying to intervene with, I guess, yeah, trying to conduct interventions where there are differences in culture, that is, yeah, culture I'd say would be the largest barrier to tackle, but then it goes back to making sure you have close relationships with the community, having that um, the key focal point, the champion on, on board in the project, and just really speaking with the community beforehand and understanding the, the context, yeah, the cultural context before anything. Are there any exciting projects you're involved with currently that we'd like to share? Yeah, so in terms of projects, so basically I'm involved in a number of different projects, um, I'm a part of the global program team at Aga Khan Foundation. And so it's more of like a high level overview of our data and getting that into our system. So numerous projects involved in, uh, for instance, health and nutrition, focusing on uh, the stunting initiative in Central Asia, um, and then looking at economic inclusion, especially for youth, again, in Central Asia. So it's really, yeah, I'm involved in uh, numerous um, areas, different projects, focusing on getting that data from the field and being able to relay those insights at a high level on what is Aga Khan Foundation doing in terms of um, health and nutrition, how many women have access to water and sanitation, for instance. So yeah, in terms of the project, it's more of an on a high level scale uh, of what I'm involved in. Before we wrap up, do you mind sharing where you see yourself being in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, in the next five to 10 years, I can see myself 
probably living um, in, I would say, East Africa. Um, I really have strong desire to be there and coming from South Sudan as well. And so, yeah, working with an international development organization and I would like to be more involved in projects focused on women and especially women's empowerment and even women's health and being involved from an analytical perspective and being able to tell a story through interventions and being able to adapt programming in that way. So yeah, definitely being on the ground is definitely where I'll see myself in the next five to 10 years. Thank you for so much for coming on the podcast, Rosie. This has been an absolutely enlightening conversation about global health and international development. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the Aga Khan Foundation, please visit www.akdn.org. If you'd like to learn more about the Irish Global Health Network or the Student Outreach Team, visit www.globalhealth.ie, where you can sign up for a newsletter. Thanks again for tuning in.